Hello and welcome to the AIM webinar series. AIM is a global industry alliance which represents the interest of everyone using barcoding, RFID, and related data capture technologies including manufacturers, software vendors, integrators, governments, and end users. AIM membership is about supporting standards, community, advocacy, and knowledge. Specifically, you will receive early access to industry technical research and information. Your membership gives you the opportunity to influence the direction of our industry and actively participate in research. AIM is an investment in your future. Before we get started, I have a few housekeeping notes to go over. First, as you may have noticed, all participants are muted throughout the presentation. We will have a Q&A session at the end of the presentation, though, and if you would like to ask questions, please click the Participants button to the right of your screen, then select AIM Member Services and submit your questions to me. Today we have Cybra's Chief Solution Architect Sheldon Reich discussing how to use machine learning to turn raw RFID into meaningful information. Welcome, Sheldon. Uh, thank you, Michael. Uh, one of the uh, an alternative title for this presentation was really uh, should should be insight from the edge. Um, I don't know if you I'm showing my age, but you may remember a, a, a novel or an autobiography in a movie called Postcards from the Edge. So insight from the edge is my way of saying that where your organization meets the, the physical world, that's, that's the edge. And I'm going to sh talk a little bit about how we can take some of that, or all that data really, from the physical world and how you can use it in your organization and to accomplish your business objectives. So artificial intelligence is around us. It's also a buzzword. We'll try to separate you know, the fact from the fiction. Um, we'll talk about, I'll explain the difference between artificial intelligence and machine learning. We'll talk how do machines learn, where RFID fits in in that paradigm, and a few use cases on the retail side and on the industrial side. And then as Michael mentioned, We'll go over uh, some questions. I remember going through Europe as a um, when I was in my teens, and I used to carry the, the, these two-way dictionaries with me. So it had uh, like English to Spanish or English Italian, and when I was in a restaurant and I wanted to be able to read the menu, I'd first you know, try to find it on the Italian side, and then uh, realize what it was saying in English and vice versa. If I wanted to ask a question, go on the English side, etc. So now we have this new technology where uh, Google allows you to take your phone, you go take a picture of the foreign menu that you're looking at, and it translates it on the fly. Now there's a, quite a number of unbelievable computational techniques that's going on there. Uh, one is there's Obviously, the image processing of identifying the fact that there are those letters in another language that's in the picture, as opposed to, um, for example, when Google translates a web page, there are um, Unicode values for each letter on the web page, and that's magnitude simpler than uh, translating text that's in an image. So it's a fascinating concept that you can drive along a road, there's a sign in a foreign language, you put your phone and take a picture, or turn on the app and point your, the camera to a road sign and it's translated in real time. It's just an unbelievable uh, capability. So, but what makes the, it so incredible is that it, it's almost something that you think that a human could do if a human had these superpowers. Why? Because we can read and we can recognize that the sign is in a foreign language and if we spoke the foreign language, we would understand and be able to read uh, what the sign is saying. So AI is the broad concept of actually, uh, of machines actually doing just what I just said. 
they, they do things that we would consider smart. Now, the point is, is that they, although they do self-learn, how do they self-learn? And machine learning is how we feed the data to this smart machine so that it can build, build its smarts, for lack of a better term. The, um, the, and the basic concept, as it says in the last line, and then the machine will learn all by itself. So machine learning is really a subset of AI. Okay, and there's the two other terms, of one which applies and one which doesn't apply. And that is, is that there's uh, virtual reality and augmented reality. You know, virtual reality, yes, it can fit in here. I'm not going to talk about it at all. But augmented reality does fit in. And we'll talk about how to use the results of the machine learning in a um, to augment reality, and that's to, to, to give you those powers that those these smart re results that uh, we're showing in the example. Okay. So, what else is machine learning and AI? NLP, natural language processing. So, um, the user interface of our dear friends Alexa, uh, Cortana, Siri, etc. That, that's just how, you, how we communicate with the device. It's the, it's the user interface. The actual, what's going on under, under the covers, though, is huge um, uh, artificial intelligence because the, all of us speak differently, yet there's a, this wake word, whether it's A-L-E-X-A, I don't want to turn on all the devices here where I am, um, or Cortana or Siri or all of those, right? So the, the systems are listening. They're listening for a pattern. They're listening for a pattern that says wake up and act on this command that's going to come out of this person's mouth, and et cetera. Even if those machines are not plugged into the network, they're, they're, they're worthless. So the, 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 the network and the, the uh, pattern matching and the processing is all done in the cloud. And the truth is, Alexa and her friends, they need machine learning on big data to, to, to survive, to shine, I and mean, they, they can't do what they're doing. And, we'll, and, and you know that they're actually learning uh, in real time and are building on their expertise when they ask you to repeat what you just said. They weren't 100% sure. That's what refines the data set. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about, uh, about, about that some more. Okay. So how do machines learn? Basically, they recognize a pattern, whether it's a pattern in a sound, a pattern in a vision, a pattern, a pattern, a pattern. They recognize a pattern. They're looking for things. They're looking for a face in a, vid in a video. That's a, looking for a pattern, looking for, like I said, the spoken word. Uh, in this example, real easy for us to find the O in a sea of Qs or find the Q in a sea of Os. But that's the co whole concept is that they are uh, it's pattern matching, pattern matching on a gigantic scale, and then making decisions based on that, on those patterns, or learning from the patterns. So, well, how do you, how do you, I mean, how are these systems built? So the systems built up by feeding um, data, and just to start their, uh, pat, you know, for what are they pattern matching? So, uh, for example, I've got a, a program called Google Photos that's on my phone, and it backs up all my photos from my camera roll. And, and when I go into the app, it decides to, it's got, uh, for example, it's already decided uh, these are my friends, and you know, and maybe it even knows their name from, from my contacts. But it'll say, here's pictures that you took of cats. Here's pictures you took of the airplanes. Here's pictures you took of bridges. Etc. And it kind of sorts up the um, it sorts the photos by these categories. So how do you do it? So uh, the Google team fed thousands of pictures, tag cat, <laughs> into the Google Photos machine learning database, and then that's how they taught the software to identify a cat. So they've loaded all these pictures of cats in various ways until the image processing 
when you throw a picture at it, it says, hmm, that's a cat. And so the very basic uh, set. Now, or the other, let, let, it's okay, cats are fun, <laughs> enough with the cat videos. What about um, stuff that would apply in a business? So the, you can also look for patterns in sensor readings, which is known as an anomaly, to discover an anomaly. Okay? So uh, you, you could even see the anomalies of these examples. They're basically the spikes. When do the spikes happen? Do they happen regularly? That's a pattern. Okay? And th 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 it's just a, a broad concept. Discovering anomalies in sensor readings. Right. So, to solve the a problem, the machine has to have, the machine learning algorithm has to have a pattern. So we talked about a pattern, we talked about discovering anomalies. Um, but the, there has to be enough samples and examples of the, of the, of, to build the pattern, so, right? I mean, the, the, it has to be so big in, in, in a human sense that, you know, one or two programmers or mathematicians can't single thread the problem in a mathematical way and come with a solution. Meaning that I can, you know, do it, you know, if A, then, you know, equals B plus J, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and I'll get a result, but that's too single thread. The concept is how does the machine figure out if I take data sources, A, B, C, D, E, F, J, et cetera, so forth, and derive meaning from these different sets of data. And it does it through structured learning. What's the structured learning? It's an iterative process. Basically, um, at the very beginning, it's very raw, and it'll seem um, it, not very intuitive. But the idea is, is that the, um, you add data. So let's say this would be an artificially intelligent uh, diagnostic, medical diagnostic system. So you'd say uh, we add data. Uh, temperature over 103, okay? Typically it's a sign that somebody's got a fever and pretty bad one at that, okay? But then you clean and prepare the data. So you're saying, okay, it has to be 103 for a certain period of time, you know, plus you put in some more symptoms, okay? So by you're training the model based on the data that you are preparing, and the, and the 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 better data, the better results. So that's how you test. Uh, you, you test it, and okay, it looks like it, it, it's seeing a pattern, you know. That will it will improve and do better and better and better. The um, and the basic thing is you rinse and repeat. That's no other way to say it. <laughs> it, it. It's by doing it over and over and over again, the machines learn to be better. But more important, and this is a key concept, and that is is that the more they uh, are learning from additional uh, data sets and samples and examples, they can then begin to, the algorithms can then begin to apply a fuzzy logic so that they can predict based on what they see. They can see, um, say stuff that's a you know, little gray and it's not exactly one or the other because the um, that's the machine learning algorithm that it, that it can um, it can make assumptions or begin to make assumptions, and that's the the intelligent part. So let's compare it. Compare uh, machine learning to, to to us. How does the human brain work? It's an unbelievable CPU plus cloud, <laughs> for lack of a better term. You've got your eyes for, for sight. The ears pick up sounds, 
your fingertips and the rest of your skin is gigantic organ that can pick up touch that also senses humidity and heat uh, uh, colors picked up by your eyes and taste through your tongue nose and smell but your 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 brain is able to take all these inputs process them instantaneously and you and get and you get meaning from meaning from it there's a fire i smell smoke it's getting hot or whatever it may be so your business too has a brain that you know should respond for lack of a better term or could respond to various sensor inputs and there's a number of them of uh, vision Oh, well, some of you have security cameras. Some of you have machine vision for doing inspection on the line of your manufacturing or just for presence or absence um, using a machine vision as a sensor. Um, light, humidity, pressure, flow, color, electricity usage, vibration, RFID, meaning at a point in time, this tag was read. Thus, you know something. You know something was read at some point. Okay? GPS, you know where it was read if you're capturing the data, and temperature, etc. Now, to just to give you a go, I'm going to go off uh, topic slightly. But um, I, because I saw this with my own eyes, uh, but I wouldn't have believed it if I hadn't seen it. But I saw it with my own eyes. So. The, for you to determine if a server is being hacked, wouldn't you, you would think you would have to have an, an agent, a software agent on you. You have to be somehow monitoring the server from the inside, from, from the disk, from in the RAM. From, you had to be inside the server to, to identify a, an exploit or to see if something's going wrong or, or watching some of the performance characteristics of the CPU or, or the, the disk going too fast or something, right? Well, what if I told you that you could measure the, ele the EMF, the electromagnetic frequency that's being emitted by that server, and if you knew what the, what the um, EMF being emitted is on when it's operating at at its peak, where it's tuned, that's where the way it should be running, yet you could sense when there was exploits being targeted against that server, and you're sensing it just from the radiation that's being emitted. You'd think that's, like, that's pretty wild stuff, right? But I actually saw it by my own eyes, okay? That I watched how the um, the EMF coming off that um, server when it was a D, uh, DDoS denial of service attack um, was being you know flooded, et cetera, and so forth, and the machine actually, for lack of a better term, glowed <laughs> differently. It was obviously having problems, and there was no other agents on the server to watch for uh, these uh, security uh, type situations, and just from being from Sensing the uh, EMF, the, uh, the researcher showed me uh, that I could even should see myself based on the waves on a waveform um, monitor to, to to know that that uh, server was under attack. So the physical uh, side at the edge. So that's what I was saying. This is this is the edge where your enterprise meets the real world. They uh, uh, these this data can be sensed can be digitized, and it can be used for a business, business purpose. So let's continue. All right. So where does RFID fit in there? It's just another one of the senses, just like the human brain has a sense. Your business may, may need to or is already sensing vision and humidity, light, pressure, et cetera, and so forth, just like what we talked about, okay? And what ties it all together? It's the time and date stamp. It's a slice in time. At this point in time, this exact 
millisecond, or what do you have to go that fast? Let's say just this exact second. This exact hours, minutes, seconds, where this camera saw this thing, and this humidity was at this percentage, and the temperature of the light was over here at this point, and the color was at this value, and the electricity was at so on, and the RFID tag was read at that point in time, at this location, at this temperature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So at that point in time, this is where the RFID tag was captured. The point is, is that you can slide the timeline. You slide a marker on the timeline, and the, it's just another measurement of what was going on in your business as RFID is considered part of the vitals, for lack of a better term, the vital signs uh, of, your, uh, of the business. Let's go with a couple of uh, use cases. So um, well, let's start with the electronic product code. It's a 96-bit uh, uh, serialized global trade item number. Um, you can tell by the code. It's a shipping unit, the company prefix. It's got your item reference, and it's got a serial number for that particular shirt or can of Coke or whatever it is. In this case, it's a... Uh, <laughs> pack of uh, paper towels. What are the kind of things that we do with RFID? Where did we read it? How many did we read? Was it sold or not? Was it stolen or not? What else? I mean, those are the typical use cases you would apply in a, in a retail uh, supply chain. That's what we do with the RFID. Oh, that little, let's go with the garments example. So we, it's an item, we're scanning it, we count it. Right? Typical inventory control use case. So you're, you're taking the inventory count at this point in time, at this you know, time and date in this particular location. So we go to another, uh, let's go into the um, case where it's a new item, uh, this uh, brand came out with this uh, brand new uh, blazer. The item is taken into the dressing room, and it's consistently not selling. Why not? What, what, did it, is it, was it so off? Did the buyers blow it so bad? Is it such a radical uh, item? I don't think so. I mean, you had these, you know, retail executives, the salespeople, and the brand managers at the brand. They say this is, you know, it's going to be a hot seller. It tested well. You know, people, um, you know, loved it virtually. They they wanted it. Uh, you know, or, or the the in the showroom, it got you know picked up off the shelves, and you bought eighty thousand of them. Why didn't it sell? Why is it not being sold? So what else can we do? So what is what are we looking for? Well, hey, hey, is it not selling across all your stores? Or is it not selling across all your customers? If you're not, you know, talking with just one store. Um, where else can you get some information that might explain why this particular item is not selling? So, here. All right, the typical planogram or the, the standard operating procedure for, for your chain is that the um, ideal color temperature for the selling floor, the changing room, and any customer-facing environment where merchandise and customers meet ideally should be at 55 to 6,000, 5,500 to 6,000 degrees Kelvin, okay? Well, what if there's an anomaly? What if the sensors are reporting, you know what? It's like 27, there's a yellow bulb in that particular dressing room because the sensors reported that the light color was wrong. Well, now in that, in one of your dressing rooms, that particular blazer looks like mustard instead of looking like the gorgeous cashmere that you originally, you know, hoped and intended it to be. So somebody would take it off the shelf front, and as soon as they take it into the changing room and put it on, 
what looked like a gorgeous cashmere um, blazer on the floor looks like a, a mustard on you, and they take it right off and they don't buy it. So that could be an explain why it didn't work there. Okay, what happens if the color temperature is okay? But the item is still not, it's, it's not something. Did the uh, factory change um, change something? Or did you change factory? Did you change suppliers? Is it all of a sudden doesn't fit the same way that the uh, samples did? Or that pre earlier in the production run, um, the, the, the fit was fine. So RFID data can then tell you, all right, now you can know when we when it changed. You can, uh, because of when all of a sudden they stop selling and stop selling through, and we match them up on that timeline to when there was a change in supplier. Okay, here's another uh, use case, another example. So um, the planogram calls for only one brand's items to be in the display. Okay, this is the whatever the Sheldon Rice department, and it's only Sheldon Rice's uh, jackets, blazers, shirts, ties, etc., that it should be in this particular area. So you cycle count, you know, every day, RFID, that makes it easy. You know, end of day, walk around with a handheld and cycle count the uh, planogram, you know, cycle count the, the, the display. Or how about this? <laughs> I've got my own reps inside the store, and I want them to cycle count the display so that the display is perfectly merchandised at the end of every day for the beginning of the next day. So just by comparing the planogram with the RFID data, the um, machine learning can tell right away if there are where, where, where the anomalies are. Okay, Hey, we saw somebody from Fred Jones or, or uh, you know, a Michael Smith shirt on the Sheldon Rice display, and then using augmented reality, as I mentioned earlier, we can show the anomalies on a planogram video display to tell the associate where the wrong items are located in the display. So it's a very nice and tight uh, use case, but unless you have this other capability there, it would be like Run, looking for a needle in a haystack. You'd know that they were there because you'd see it in the um, count, but you wouldn't know where to find them. Okay. Let's talk about some industrial uh, use cases. Excuse me. So um, suddenly your products are being returned with structural failure, yet your factory, your machines, did not report any error you know, nothing was obvious that uh, that the operators felt they had to press the red button, stop the line. So how do you determine which products need to be recalled and which ones might fail in the future? Well, what does the data say? Well, gee, you know, we had an unusual temperature and humidity in July. Did the sensors report anything? Were we within the range, the operating range? And then when did the product begin to fail? Hmm, look at that. All the products that were manufactured in July seem to have a problem. And sure enough, if you check, if you individually and annually check the sensor, you have an anomalies on, uh, on you know, beginning of July here. Now, the readings were well within the calibration value, okay? So there's um, the calibration value for this particular machine is, you know, it's okay. It can go up to, what it was, a 50 down to zero, whatever the, whatever the number is what it's supposed to be, okay? And it was still within that, with that number, but there was still some movement in it, and only by looking over a large example and a large sample of data could the system tell you that here's where the problem may have begun because you didn't get an alarm because uh, all, I mean all the I mean, not all of them but typically the modern sensors that are installed 
are installed with individual monitors, individual software or alerting solutions where if the RPM goes to 4,500 or above whatever the number is, you know, we'll send a text message. Well, that's great. It'll tell the operator this machine's spinning out of control, but it's more important that that data be considered as part of the overall context, a lack of better term, for the health of the factory. And that's where that time and date stamp and the big learning, the big data, will, um, will come, uh, come, comes to value. So here the readings for this sensor were well within the calibration value. Um, that, you know, maybe the structural integrity was never tested at a time of both high humidity and when the machine's a little spinning at the higher end of its calibration. It's the kind of stuff, kind of insight that you can get from the edge through machine learning. So this, what, what, what can we take away from this? So first, I'd like to point your attention to the graphic here on the right. There's a concept known as hysteresis. Hysteresis is, an, almost for lack of a better term, an averaging. Um, and we all, every one of us, uh, knows and, have, and, and deal with the positive effects of this. Hysteresis is when you're using a, a thermostat, for example, the, uh, the, you know, the, your heater or your air conditioner does not go on and off with every single you know, degree of um, change in temperature. Not like the blower and the air and the compressor or the heat, whatever it is, the heating element. It doesn't go constantly go off, on, off, on, off, on, off, on. A, you'll burn the equipment out, but it, it, it would not be very efficient. So the hysteresis is the smoothing of the curve. It smooths and averages the readings so that, you know, it can turn it on and then, you know, maybe turn off, but it keeps it on a, in an even keel. In a, in, a, in a softer slope over a period of time. So now, so softer slope period of time, those kind of things don't kind of match, match up evenly, for lack of a better term, in a uh, the way we've been talking about uh, feeding data into a machine learning system. So that's where we get the difference between analog and digital. And analog is a wave. It's a, it's a continuous um, reading, an analog sensor. It reads up, it reads down, it's, it's just continuously moving. Um, uh, digital is a discrete, it's on or it's off. Okay? So what, has to, what happens is an analog to digital conversion where the, a curve is converted into a series of little steps. And each of those steps can be captured. So you you have yeah, and then so you're showing the extreme close up there on the curve, and you see the individual uh, steps, and that's how that, that's how you can convert the analog to digital. So basic concept is is that even the most analog of your processes that can be converted to digital, which is just another set of data to be added to your machine learning system. So the more data better, the more the system learns. And RFID data is valuable long after the product's been manufactured, shipped through your supply chain, and sold. It's, in, in the olden days, as those of us who have the scar tissue to show for it, uh, way back in you know, the ancient history of 2003, um, when RFID was in the uh, EPC space was first introduced, the, there was a lot of discussion and challenge about what to do about um, all this RFID data. There's so many reads, you know, and that was because at that time uh, storage was expensive, relatively speaking. Um, it cost, it would take up, you know, uh, to, uh, there's a lot of, of, of data being generated by the RFID readers, and the, we didn't, you know, the businesses didn't want to dedicate hard disks to RFID data. So what they would do is they would 
just take the transaction and throw out all the RFID uh, reading part of it. Um, nowadays, it's a no-brainer. First of all, there's two, two things that make, the, make that uh, it's no longer an issue. Number one, uh, the processing at the edge of uh, modern RFID readers with the correct software can uh, smooth and dedupe, for lack of a better term, smooth and filter the data, the RFID uh, data, so that the, you, they will, though they're reading 200 times a second, you don't need to, to have 200 tag reads a second in this repository for machine learning purpose, only when there's a change. And this, a, there's a, only when there's a change in either the, uh, the, the tag itself, which, which in, a, in a passive RFID, it's not going to happen, but in a change on the uh, location or on the time and date stamp. So if you have one per second, you know, really, if, as long as that's in the reading zone, if it's in that reading zone for that point of time, fine. And, but their uh, data or storage is not nowhere near the expense as it used to be. And even if we do it in an archive uh, basis, an archive and take it offline, the point is you'll have it and you can use it for your sampling. Um, key point, the key takeaway here is we do not know today what our RFID data can tell us tomorrow or next month or next year, especially the more it's combined with the other sensors at the edge. Because there's so many ways that, um, not that if nothing else, it's uh, your performance on your, on your, on your supply chain. <laughs> if nothing else, you'll know, you know, well, well, you know, you'll know in advance, hey, in the summer months, uh, they, 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 our packing is 30% slower, whatever it is. That comes out because you've got some additional sensors they either to tell you why, as opposed to just seeing, hmm, you know, how come we, you know, we, we, we packed 30% less than we packed last year? Was it, was it because the sales were down, whatever? No, maybe it's literally environmental. Everybody needs to stop and take a drink because you don't have an air conditioner in the, in the, in the uh, warehouse. We, uh, we don't know. Um, but this is the way to get those answers. So what's the, um, what's the next uh, step to get started? Well, first, as I repeated it once, I repeated it a thousand times. Save all the data you get. Everything you can capture, capture it, and because that will be the beginnings of your data set. Um, I mean, here's a, the alien um, um, handheld can capture uh, the GPS. Why not capture the GPS location every time you read the tag with that, with that unit? It doesn't cost more. It captures it. Save it. And now it'll be... Uh, a useful piece of information for you in the future. To learn more about the Internet of Things and artificial intelligence and machine learning, um, check out these uh, major platforms, IBM Watson, Google TensorFlow, uh, Amazon Web Services as, as plenty. As a matter of fact, you could, uh, uh, they've got some nice uh, kits for uh, investigating AI and A-L-E-X-A. Because um, she's always listening, and uh, Microsoft Azure as well, and, uh, and even the Oracle Cloud. So this is a quite an, uh, a new uh, era. Uh, as you know, um, the number one job opening in the field is data scientist. There's more data scientist openings throughout the country, even the world, than any other position. So uh, I want to thank everybody for taking the time out. Hopefully I've opened your eyes. And I think the most important thing that you can take away from this is, is there may be a, inside your space, there may be your world, whether it's, um, whether you're a manufacturer, a distributor, or a retailer, um, there are secrets to be unlocked. And the same way that somebody woke up, maybe it's Fred Smith himself, I don't know, and uh, FedEx decided, you know what, why are we sitting here waiting for the phone to ring and staffing call centers just to give the status of an update of a tracking number 
right? Remember those days? You'd call up the NATO number. Where is 752127224? And they'd look it up and they'd say it's in Cincinnati. And they said, why don't we just make it self access? At the first, it was a terminal that you know big shippers could put in there, um, inside their locations, and they had a, could log in to the FedEx system. And then, of course, it went on the web. And now it's so ubiquitous that uh, it's hard to imagine that there was a time before this use of the technology even existed. Approach what's going on in your facilities and in your customers' the facilities the same way. Is there a way to really transform the business just by connecting two pieces of existing technology, or three, or four, or more? And that's the whole deal. The idea being that there's data there, it's useful data, perhaps machine learning is a way for me to get some additional insight from that data so that I get a, just a better picture about what's going on in my enterprise and to even make some better decisions going forward. Uh, thank you very much, and uh, let's uh, open up to questions. Yes, thank you, Sheldon. Uh, there's still time to get questions if you'd like. Just go to the chat option and you can send those right over to me. Uh, the first question we received is, can you give an example of how AI and RFID can help in picking and packing? Hmm. Okay. So picking and packing. So the, um, the, the, the basic um, um, use case in picking and packing with RFID is validation, meaning that the order is loaded into the RFID system, the items are picked, and they're picked fast, let's say, okay? So the, um, that's the idea. You don't have to stop and scan everything, so they're thrown into a bucket, they're thrown into a basket, they go into a tunnel, they go into a conveyor, they go to a portal. and if everything is picked on that order, that's the validation. You get the green light, and everything's okay. Where does the RFID come in? When there's, let's say, items not on that. Um, where does the AI come in? When there's, you pick the wrong item. So wait a second. Okay. So there we send up, and we put up a flag, a red flag, or, or some way we notify the operator that there's a mistake. He's got to find the wrong one, pulls it out. So then he'll go back to the shelf and say, wow, the shelf was empty. Well, maybe AI can do one of two things. Can uh, A, automatically check a nearby bin if it was seen. Maybe something was put away. But more importantly, maybe suggest if the customer allows in their preferences to receive, for example, let's say, you picked, um, you know, uh, I'll think of a commercial food processor. Uh, the order was for 12 cases of um, tomato sauce in a 64-ounce can, okay? And uh, they were short one. So AI could say, according to the uh, um, customer's preferences, they allow um, substitutions. You know, what's a good substitution for that? Either another brand, same size, or 18, you know, 32-ounce cans in a, in a case. Those kind of, that, that, that would be the first one that I would think of, meaning that it could help the user. Well, the user may be frozen, wouldn't know what to do. You got to, you know, pick the wrong item, and there's, the shelf is empty. You listen, so the, it's now an out-of-stock, uh, you know, the... Uh, the system could have a have some um, smarts in it to be able to determine what's a, an acceptable substitute. Okay, great. Thank you for that. Uh, another question we we received is: You discussed Google a little bit in the presentation. Have you heard anything about their TensorFlow system? Actually, the TensorFlow. Yes, I. I suggested that that's one of the resources that um, that, that you can um, uh, to, to, to explore, to, to, to learn more about 
um, the system. Uh, that was one of my resources for developing the presentation. The, the TensorFlow is a uh, Google. One thing I do know about Google: Google, Google develops their own tools. So they don't. In other words, they have a whole department of programmers who build the compilers and the programming tools that they build, whether it's containers or TensorFlow, or et cetera, and so forth. So they build their own tools. Those, their tools are unique. Um, their, their tools are you know, powerful but the, um, they're, and very good. But the, the, the key takeaway here is they've got certain capabilities that, the, that no one else has. Just to, you know, we just have to spend time with it to learn the um, the specifics of the um, of the interface and and, and how they're uh, you know how, how how to work with with the systems. I mean, each of the uh, AI platforms it is a platform, and they each have different rules for how to you know uh, load the data sets. Okay. Um, but if you, you know, choose to, to make a uh, commitment in this area, um, whether it's Google, IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, etc., each of those providers will, you know, depending on your level of commitment, will, will can assign you um, uh, machine learning scientists who are familiar with their platforms to show you how, how to load and, uh, the sample data and to test it and, and start to build it. Okay, great. Another question we received, and I know you talked a about it a little bit in one of your earlier si slides about AI and the human mind, but it, they're asking, is artificial intelligence trying to put the human mind in a computer? Interesting question. The, um, I personally don't think so. I would, I, I like to think the other way. I think, uh, you know, artificial intelligence in the production world is actually trying to put Superman's mind in a uh, computer. And the reason why I say that is that obviously, um, I shouldn't say obviously, but <laughs> I can't imagine where the data sets would be coming from. And that is, is that the um, uh, there's nuance and emotion that the human mind has that uh, is hard, harder than uh, sensor readings to feed into a, a, machine learning, a, a machine learning system, okay? And the ability of, uh, of, a, human pers of, a, hum of a human mind to determine Something as similar, as simple as irony, or something as simple as satire, is that is um, beyond, to me. It's beyond the ability to model for it because it requires a skepticism, which is another <laughs> human quality that um, that machine learning can't really comprehend, put its head around. I think the the one of the takeaways that I've talked about before was that the when the if you can convert it to digital, meaning this pixel is, is a whisker and this pixel is an eyeball, or you know temperature or light or uh, you know a, a position of something, or th that stuff can be uh, converted and loaded in. So, for example, to, to know that there's a fire, obviously, we have fire alarms, um, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, all those things that humans respond to, ouch, it's hot, or, or it hurts, or it's too loud, all those kinds of uh, sensor phenomena, yes, that's what AI does. It replaces that capability of the human mind. Um, the, but as to somebody making a joke about um, this, um, you know, this product is selling like hotcakes would probably not really, would probably stump the, 
of the, of the machine learning database because it wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be the way you would clean, a, 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 a clean, clean the data. But the reason why I say Superman is because the you know, certain sensors, yeah, we can see from space, right? We can see thousands, you know, many miles. We can see underground. We can see through water, etc. That's why we uh, that, and that's really the, the the beauty of it is to be able to to think bigger than any one person can think, and thus be able to um, answer questions that are beyond the mind of any individual person, simply because we can't process as much data at one time. And that's what these things are very good at, always have been. Great question. All right, thanks. Another question we have received is, have you faced pushback from anyone in regards to implementing AI or machine learning in like a warehouse or any working process, I guess? Okay. So the, uh, the pushback, it, it's funny, we, uh, we, we've had pushback more uh, along the lines of, okay, I understand what you're trying to do and uh, we think it's great. The question is, um, we, 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 you have to uh, protect the privacy, which we totally understand as a vendor. Uh, for, for example, the um, for safety, this is in safety and security uh, use cases. Just what we're, we, we were talking about right now. Um, sensors are, can identify a odorless, colorless gas, and we can uh, sensors. Uh, based on an accelerometer, we can tell if a worker's fallen down, or we could tell if a worker's idle and has, you know, perhaps he had a heart attack or something. Okay, that so that technology is incredibly attractive to our customers. On the other hand, it's the same technology that they want to assure we they want us to assure them that is not used so that the uh, system knows that the workers in the bathroom. Abs you know, just turn off the system when they walk through that door, and turn off the system when they come, and turn it back on when they come back on, or keep the system off the whole time. No, no feedback at all until unless there's an emergency. So that's where the where the pushback is. There's no real pushback on the. Uh, from an artificial intelligence standpoint, when the um, artificial intelligence can uh, solve problems that are beyond even the existing uh, uh, computer, um, you know, the existing IT department. And I think that w one of the pushbacks is based on, the, inter on the, 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 the interface that we talked about for a number of our technologies in the AIM marketplace. So there's a, um, a vocal, voice uh, directed picking or light directed picking. Uh, so on any on any task that the the computer, for lack of a better term, is guiding the operator. Okay, walk to aisle A4 or look for the green light on the shelf. Um, the the worker may feel that, you know, in other words, he doesn't have a chance to, to take his own break. I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sure he does. I can't imagine they just, you know, force you to go running after the, the green lot, the green dot. But the um, where this technology would fit in is helping to um, guide the where the green dot would be located, perhaps in a more efficient way. But uh, the, so I have the, the truth is the, the pushback is more only about privacy, not about what is being captured uh, as far as the sensor data and, and, ha and what it's being used for. So great question. Okay, yeah, great. Another question about implementation. Are you aware of which countries, if any, are leading in implementing artificial intelligence? Okay, I think it's a. Um, the, I would I would say it's the United States only because of the, the some of the tools, but it's also dependent on um, there's 
of certain academic use cases, or not use cases, academic research that's going on. That um, so it's, it's a it's a that's a hard uh, uh, term to answer in terms of nationality of uh, success because, um, for example, um, Mobileye, which is an unbelievable uh, uh, autonomous vehicle. Um, a vision system, for lack of a better term, that was purchased by, I think it's either Intel or GM or whatever. But anyway, so that was, uh, came out of uh, Israel. Um, and it was a pure artificial intelligence play. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean that Israel is the, you know, a, a, the leader in, in artificial intelligence. I think that um, what I'm talking about is, is where it relates to what's important to you. So if you're in a heavy manufacturing environment in a, a, let's say, a country like South Korea, which is a heavy manufacturing country, so the advances in heavy manufacturing would, would, would naturally be located uh, where, where, you know, where the opportunity would be. Um, so I'm not quite sure I can answer that question. Okay. How long does it take before a warehouse can leverage the data you were talking about? Oh, actually, that's it's pretty soon. I would say you you begin to see these results in um, you know a season or two, even sooner. I mean, for example, what's the first payback for RFID from a warehousing standpoint in the again in the retail supply chain? The, the this is like consistent, and other people have have spoken about it as well. And that is is that the you know ROI of of six months, okay. Now, what is that on? That's based on the reduced chargebacks. Is that if you're getting a chargeback of, you know, $100 a carton or whatever they, you know, the retail partners are charging, boy, that stuff adds up real fast. And by able to, to go back, you know, six months, a year, a year and a half, two years, and say, hey, I sent you that carton, and that carton had these EPCs inside, these items, and I sent it on this date, and it went out on this truck, and it was signed for by your person on this on this date. You don't know no, that's not a chargeback. I'm I'm fighting it, etc. Just by the reduction of chargebacks, RFID systems pay for themselves. So what I'm talking about is getting additional value out of the out of the RFID investment. Uh, so to talking about a typical retail brand that uh, is has got a lot of you know. Ins and outs, a lot of cross docking, a lot of uh, uh, shipments that are going to either retail or DCs or direct to store. A um, lot going on. Why not capture the data, put it to work, and if I mean, and then but what, what we do need, if you if you're asking, you're talking about how soon. How about talking about who needs to be involved? It's it's obviously a uh, you need a hero who, who's, you know, the, the, that person who's going to take the RFID uh, and, and uh, implement it, to, uh, you know, and get the project done. But it can't be one man in a, or woman in a silo. It's got to be in conjunction with a plant operator, with a plant manager, especially in manufacturing. If you're going to, uh, you know, tap into those sensors and share, share that data, um, everybody's got to be involved. And you just, you know, you set up a little cross-functional team of people that know what the data is and where it's located so that the data sets can be put together and uh, you can monitor it and feed it into, a, uh, into this machine learning system. Great question. Okay, Sheldon, and one last question to wrap things up here. Is Cybra bringing in other sensor data beyond RFID? The answer is yes. And uh, the, what the, uh, our product is called Edgefinity IoT. And what it does is it, um, we, instead of being limited to just RFID uh, on an item or an asset or et cetera, we've architected it to be either um, uh, Bluetooth, a BLE, or 
uh, VTAG, which is a met mesh networking, or active RFID, or ultra wideband, etc. So there's different types of technologies that can be used for uh, the tracking. And in addition, we, like I talked about before, accelerometer, humidity, gas, fire, smoke, uh, those kinds of sensors are payloads that are included in some of the, uh, tech, the tracking technology that we're using now. And we use that, those um, payloads um, in, in our rule development, uh, et cetera, so that you can, um, for example, um, shut a door if, it's get the, if um, you know, we identify that there's a gas that's poisonous gas or a caustic uh, material. So they, uh, the system is for um, identifying assets and items and people, as well as protecting people and um, being able to react based on various inputs. Hopefully that answered the question, but if you write to me, well, give us a holler. Uh, um, you know, look us online, cyber.com. We'd be glad to uh, answer any further questions that you have. Okay, great. Well, thank you for your time today, Sheldon. You're very welcome, Michael. And thank you to our audience for their active participation today. Once again, thanks, everyone, and have a great rest of your day. Take care. <laughs>